I used to read my children a, uh, a particular children's book about a father teaching his children how to ride a bike. And the book ends up being slapstick comedy gold. And like, you know, right up there with the Abbott and Costello stuff. As the father tries to get, get the bike up and, you know, show the child how to get up on the bike. And it just falls on over and crashes. And as he stands up to his feet, he goes, yeah, that was an example of what not to do. Let that be an example to you. And it goes on from there in that spirit. My kids really enjoyed it. Uh, but, and as much as they enjoyed that, you know, sometimes we need a bad example indeed to understand the good example that we do need to follow. And regretfully, the Pharisees this morning give us a great example of what not to do. As far less entertaining than the book that I used to read my children, but it is far more needful for the soul. We remarked last time as we began this list of seven woes, uh, these are a summary Jesus gives of the shortcomings of the scribes and Pharisees. And so, with a lot to get through, let us waste no time in picking right up where we left off in verse 15 that says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell As yourselves. Now, this second woe is not necessarily against, you know, proselytizing, you know, which is simply sharing the faith, so much as Jesus hears against how they were going about it. How they were going about it. I mean, what's the point of sending a messenger of God to people if his message is not from God? What did you accomplish at the end of the day if you have a supposed convert, but neither the preacher nor the convert actually know Jesus or actually are saved? You know, about five years ago, a dear friend of mine started listening to one very popular pastor. I'll withhold the name for now. And this particular guy has been on my radar for a while, but I never really looked into this particular guy because I had no reason to. Just, you know, I had not, no vested interest But then once I had a friend deeply interested and invested, so was I. And for six months, I didn't miss a single sermon from this particular person. And the first two or three were, sounded good enough. I had no complaints. But by the next one, by the end of that first month, I knew something was wrong. And here's the problem. After six months of listening to a particular pastor online, I never once heard the word repent. In six months, nor did I hear the cross explained, nor did I hear the gospel explained, how to be saved, even once. Every, every, every message was basically, hey, times are hard, but God is good. God's going to bring you through your wilderness. God's going to help you save your Goliath. And other, you know, well-meaning, happy messages like that. And that sounds okay. At first, we do need encouragement. I'm not one of those pastors that's against encouragement. Don't don't take that wrong. (laughs) But here's the problem. That particular preacher was suffering from what I've referred to since called main character complex. They forget who the main character is. They, uh, They were where you make yourself the main character of every story. Especially when you're reading the Bible, it's all about you. Here's the problem, though. The Bible's not about you. The Bible is fundamentally not about you and how you can face your Goliaths and how God's going to bring you through your wilderness. The Bible's about Jesus. Fundamentally, the scriptures from the first book to the last is about Jesus Christ and how he is the one who saves us, how he delivers us from darkness. He is the David that slays the Goliath of sin and shame that separated us from God. When we have to get that right, and if you can go six months without teaching on literally the main point of the Bible, something is wrong. Something's off balanced. It's like reading a main character where, I mean, it's like reading a book where the main character is removed. Imagine reading a Sherlock Holmes novel without Sherlock Holmes. It would feel empty. Something's missing. Which brings me to point number two. When all you teach is essentially motivational talks rooted in 
that aren't rooted in Christ's completed work on the cross, and that's kind of like going on an all ice cream diet. Yeah, that sure will taste delicious. My kids will sign up for that diet in a heartbeat. But you will die of malnourishment on that in no time. The same thing happens spiritually. We will die spiritually malnourished if all we focus on is the fluffy stuff and we don't come down to the substance that is the gospel. Because above all else, I need to be reminded of my Savior's love for me, which was displayed through the cross. What he did to save me, how he is enough for me. That's where we get the strength to face the day. Not in some fluffy comment that God's going to bring you through the wilderness. I'm sure, but by meditating on how God brought us through the greatest wilderness, if you get what I'm saying. And churches like that will have people, here's the problem, people, churches like that will have people pew, filling the pews every Sunday, and they think that because they're in church and hearing about God, that they are right with God, that everything's good. But in reality, they can end up being twice the child of hell as they are because the gospel that saves is missing. I'm not the one pronouncing judgment here. It's withholding the message of salvation is damnation. It's like, it's like a boat refusing to throw a life raft to somebody out at sea. I don't share the exclusivity of the gospel or the need to be saved every week because it's popular. I only preach this way because I have no other gospel than this one. I have no other gospel to preach than the one Jesus came to bring us. But moving on, verse 16 introduces a third woe, which has been called a perversion of truth, where it says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. In short, this is a very bizarre way of handling your oaths and vows. (laughs) Anyone else, as you were reading this, kind of think of when we were kids and we used to cross our fingers and say, oh, I don't have to keep my promise. My fingers were crossed. They're behind my back. (laughs) I can lie all I want. My fingers were crossed. It's the same vein as that, isn't it? Just that much more sad when the religious leaders were doing effectively the same thing. Saying that, I mean, someone theoretic could could lie all they wanted and their oaths mean nothing provided they swore by the temple and not the gold of the temple. Weird, right? It's all about their words. If they didn't, where their words were more important than their attitudes. They had all the right way of phrasing everything but the way they were living was a complete train wreck. And, you know, I'm just going to rush straight to the application here for time, but do you also justify your sins? Do we find ways of, clever ways of making our offenses before God slightly more passable just because of the way we word something or the excuse that we give? Oh, everyone in my family is like this. Uh, uh, This is just the way I was raised. Oh, everyone I know struggles with this particular sin. Oh, it's all right. Jesus is just going to forgive me anyway. No, 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 no. Don't ever think like that. That's the wrong attitude. The Bible describes one attitude that we are supposed to have towards our sins. And that's repentance. Turning from our sins. Turning to Christ away from that. To see our sin the way that God sees it, confess it to God, turn to him for forgiveness, and to keep striving away from that sin and striving towards Christ. Romans 6 says that through Christ we have died to our sins, we, and we can't live in them any longer. Why accept defeat when Christ has purchased the victory for us? 
And look, I get it. We, we, we all still sin. Nobody is perfect. Certainly not I. That's not what I'm saying. But every part of us, I, I get that every part of us has been tainted by sin, but to excuse it, to justify it, or to make light of it and pass it away is an insult to Christ who died for that sin. If someone loved you enough to take a bullet for you at the bad end of town, how little do you respect their sacrifice if you keep walking down those same streets? And yet, and yet we do that every time that we justify our sins as if Jesus didn't die on account of those sins. So hear me, saints. I'm not advocating for some kind of legalistic perfectionism like the Pharisees were. That's not what I'm saying at all here. But to live comfortably as a Christian with sin ruling and reigning in your life is a contradiction of terms. It's an oxymoron. It's a thing that ought never be. Which, again, that's why that word repentance is so important. It does matter. It needs to be preached and it needs to be enacted in each of our hearts. It's our response to the gospel is repentance, that turning to God away from that sin. That's our spiritual act of worship. So is that us? Do we justify our sins or do we treat them the way the Bible calls us to? But moving on to the fourth woe for time's sake in verse 23, We furthermore ask, uh, have we been neglecting the weightier matters of the law? Where verse 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. In short, we could describe this as majoring in the minors and minoring in the majors. That's the next example of what not to do that we get from the Pharisees. See, under the old covenant, the the Israelites would have to tithe or pay a tenth on the increases of all of their goods and crops. Tenth of it was given to the system. It supported the temple. It supported the worship. It supported the government, which was tied to the worship back then. That's what the tithe took care of back then. But like everything else, the Pharisees just couldn't be normal about it. They had to do it the weird way. Uh, Because what, what they would do, and what Jesus is referring to in verse 23, is that many of them would count out every individual herb And in some case, weigh out every individual seed and tithe based off of that. The Bible didn't instruct it to do it in such an extreme way. I imagine they did it just to show off how holy they were and how much more careful they spent their time thinking about worship than you did. Just based off of their heart, that seems to be it. But now Jesus carefully doesn't come out against the tithe. That wasn't what Jesus' gripe was with. But in putting all of their effort into this minor stuff and neglecting the most important parts of the law, parts that if you were to take it all together really summarizes the law. Justice, giving people what they deserve. Uh, Mercy, which is withholding what others deserve. And faithfulness, uh, which simply means living in light of, of the truth of the gospel. Living as if those things are true, being faithful to God, living by faith. And Jesus here even uses a brilliant example of hyperbole, saying that it's like these people go out of their way to strain out the tiniest known insect from their wine, while at the same time swallowing the largest unclean mammal in the region. You missed it by a mile. By the way, don't ever say that Jesus didn't have a sense of humor. That's funny. Picture of Jesus swall- of a man swallowing a camel, a wide hole. That that's a funny picture in your mind. Our Savior had a sense of humor. But to be serious, do we do the same? Do we also minor in the majors and major in the minors? 
You know, many churches have actually forgotten what they are around for. You know, pastors and church staff have been known in many cases to spend countless hours on meetings and committees and drafting reports on this and that without actually being the church. All the denominational reports are in early. The budget was submitted. But they didn't spend any time working on their sermon. Didn't spend any time in prayer. No time encourage, you know, encouraging being in fellowship or engaging in discipleship. It's, it's like one of those Rube Goldberg machines some of these churches have become where all this activity is going on, this highly complicated system. But nothing at the end of the day gets done. Just goes around for the sake of going around. Some churches are like that. It's a lot of activity, but you don't see the fruit of it. Because they've forgotten their mission. Others have forgotten their mission altogether and abandoned it to be too focused on political or social issues of the day. They have well-crafted statements on every social issue, but... And they, they fly every virtue signaling flag from their organizations. They have airtight and clean records of every last minor meeting the church has. But they never preach the gospel. They never engage in meaningful mission work. Or certainly not doing outreaches like the kind that we had the other night. Now, I'm under no delusion that we are a perfect church. <laughs> I'm pointing the finger right back out at me. (laughs) Because at the very least, you guys are stuck with me (laughs) and all of my flaws that I bring to the table. I'm aware that I bring a few. It's been said, if you guys ever find a perfect church, don't attend there. You will ruin it. (laughs) There's some truth to that. And I say yes and amen for myself too. But I believe that this church is laboring for all the right things. We are striving towards keeping the main thing the main thing. And th- that, that's our call. But enough about the churches and talking about other churches. What about you personally? What does your spiritual life look like? You know, I have a friend of mine whose son is about ready to go off to college and Sounds like a great guy, as my friend is describing him. He's entrepreneurial. He's a man of character. He has all the right political opinions. Let's just assume they believe exactly what you believe. (laughs) But, uh, and to top it all off, he believes in Jesus too. All good things. He He even helps out at the church occasionally. But his church, but his spiritual life is, had been described to me as mostly about checking the boxes. It's very surface level. Yeah, he came to church. Someone asked him to come with him. Yeah, he helped out because somebody was asking him to help out with something. Yeah, he'll pray if, you know, everyone else is praying and, you know, okay, I'll join in the group. But left alone of everybody else's influences, is he going to check the boxes? It's a, it's an, it's a dif, difficult question. It's very surface level. And guys, how many of us would be content with a surface level relationship with someone we love? Just keeping it all on the surface, checking the boxes. I got my, got my phone call in on the holiday celebrating them. I, I, I made the effort once a year to go and go visit the person. I've checked the box. Who, who of you would be content with that, with your, your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad? Who would be content with that? But yet, we do the same with our Jesus. (laughs) So many of us are content with this surface level. And like all all I can say is if your experience with Jesus is exhaustively described as a Sunday morning thing, you are missing the you're missing the tip of the iceberg, (laughs) much less everything else that we are meant to enjoy of our Savior. Because he's not just a box that we check. He is your friend that sticks closer than your brother. He's your Savior that has wiped your sins away and gave you eternal life. The reason why we can be anxious for nothing. He's the reason why we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Have you discovered the joy of knowing Jesus personally? Because it'll change your life if you do. 
and taking it off of the surface level and bringing it deep where it belongs. And if that's you, just reach out to him. You don't need to go through a pastor or a priest or any organization. If that's you, just meet with God in your car before you leave today. Just spend a minute in prayer and just speak to God the way a man would speak to his friend. So that's how the Bible tells us to pray. Just speak to God. Pour out your heart to him. Read his word. Put on some worship music this week and spend some time thinking about him. Enjoy him for the way he's meant to be enjoyed. And by the way, as it's, this passage talks about how the weightier matters of the law are justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You know, there's, there's been an awful lot of talk about justice in our media and in our culture the last couple of, couple of years especially. And there's a lot of confusion as to what that term has become to mean. Because I can't help but to think of an 80s movie quote as, I'm, as I hear these words about uh, justice. And we want justice. Justice for this and that. Well, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. It's a... Uh, the, the way people use that word today, they, they, it, it seems to convey this idea of distribution, of you know, help, you know, making things even. Everybody gets the same outcomes. That's what justice looks like. And uh, same thing with the word equity, equality of outcomes. That's what equity has become to mean in the last couple of years in our modern culture. But our dictionaries haven't even caught up to those definitions yet. You know, the, the way the Bible describes justice and equity is the same way that you know, the dictionaries do that say that justice is giving someone what they deserve. And equity simply means to be fair and impartial, enforcing justice impartially. That's what the Bible and the dictionary, by the way, define as justice and equity. And so people have to be very careful as they use the, supposedly use the Bible as the reason why they get involved in social justice causes. You got to be careful with it. You got to be consistent with your definitions because like I've said this before and it bears repeating, if God were to give us all justice, we'd all be dead. If we all got what we deserve, we'd all be dead and in hell. Because that's what our sins had deserved. That goes all the way back to the garden. Genesis where, you know, Back then in Genesis 3, you know, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, your sins have separated you from God. You can't, we cannot go to heaven in our own abilities because of our sins. So if God were to give us what is fair, what is just, what we have earned, well, we don't want that. We don't want justice. What we actually need is mercy for God to withhold what we deserve. But how can God withhold, mer withhold his justice to give us mercy? That would make God unjust. We can't have that. That's a problem. God is perfect. He cannot be an unjust judge. Which is why it is such a beautiful mystery that there is only one place in all of human history where both uh, justice, mercy, and grace converge without contradicting each other. And that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because... Only in that place, God satisfied his justice by having Jesus bear the punishment for our sins. And by which he could then show us his mercy. By letting, us, letting the guilty as we are go free. And give us grace because we did not earn his favor for any of these things or the age to come. But simply because Jesus loves you that much. That's the good news of the gospel where God delivered his justice not upon us sinners, but on the sin bearer. Gave us his mercy by letting us, the guilty, go free. And the gift of grace that we will expend for all eternity with him. Praise God for that. Now don't get me wrong, as Christians, do we care about the oppressed? The rights of others? About the poor and those struggling? Of course we do. Nobody's ever going to accuse this church of not caring for the poor. No, goodness, we, we're, we're very much involved in those 
in, the, in those areas. And that's why the Apostle James said that true and undefiled religion is to take care of orphans and widows in their time of need. But if we don't also share the gospel, the good news of this convergence of justice, mercy, and grace, then at the end of the day, all we're doing is rearranging the deck chairs of the Titanic. It's all going down anyway. What have we left behind? That's what it means to tithe on mint, dill, and cumin, but neglect the weightier matters of the law. That's why Jesus said that these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. It's both and, not either or. I don't get how people don't seem to understand. You can, it's, it, it's this false dichotomy that you have to choose between a church that seeks justice and a church that preaches the gospel. <laughs> We're called to do both in, instricably. It don't, that tension only exists if you redefine justice as something it does not mean. But anyway, quickly in closing, I, I just want to ask, is, is your life out of balance as the Pharisees' lives were? Are you beginning to be, I mean, are you influenced by some of those false teachers out there that aren't teaching the full gospel? Because that spiritual and that malnourishment will catch up to you eventually. Are you justifying your sins through clever excuses or hiding them behind religious rituals? Or do you confess them and repent of them, turning to Christ with them? And lastly, are you majoring in the minors and minoring in the majors spiritually? Excelling in all the outward stuff, showing up to church, Bible studies, and outreaches, but neglecting the weightier matters of a real relationship with God from the heart, believing the gospel, enjoying him the way we are called to. Beware of this great example of what not to do. Jesus came to give us far more than what the Pharisees have outlined. We're called to enjoy a relationship with God from the heart. Amen, church?